charming um, members of OKS and pupils and staff. And of course, the Campbells, we're delighted to have them with us this evening. Um, so I'm sure we're in for a fascinating talk this evening. Um, John Campbell's book uh, about Haldane, who he's obviously going to be talking about, is here, Prime Position. Rush out to bookshop afterwards. <laughs> Or go to the library, actually. Right. A couple of copies in the library. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce John Campbell this evening and his talk on Richard Burden Haldane, uh, based on the biography that he's written, The Forgotten Statesman Who Shaped Modern Britain. Uh, and it has garnered considerable praise uh, from many esteemed reviewers, including Gordon Brown, Frank Field, um, to also historians, diplomats, and members of the armed forces. Um, but John has actually asked me to leave the holding related parts to him. Um, so I will just say a few words about our speaker um, and his very personal connection with King. So John Campbell came to King to Mysore Omas in 1960 and left in 1965. His three brothers each also came to King's and to MO. His elder brother Malcolm went on to Oxford, he and his brother Nicholas to Cambridge, and Nicholas's twin Andrew to Edinburgh. And it was easy to get talks from Cambridge in those days. It was just, we just discovered it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Andrew, who was seven years younger than John, was a keen rugby player, read divinity at Edinburgh, and spent his career in the army. Sadly, he died of cancer at only 67 last September, and to commemorate his death, his daughter Rosie, in May this year, came here to King's, and after only a few hours sleep at the headmaster's house, set out at 3.30 a.m. and ran the 67 miles to London. So 15 hours later, one imagines pretty exhausted, she got to Hyde Park Corner, where she joined family and friends, and uh, had a drink in the bar of the Lanesborough Hotel, which apparently was Andrew's and hers favourite place to drink margaritas, which sounds like a jolly good way to remember somebody to me. Um, John has asked me to emphasise that he is not a historian. Um, he did science and economic A-levels um, here and read economics at Cambridge and then became a merchant banker, a corporate financier and eventually an entrepreneur in the sense that 35 years ago he set up with two others their own financial advisory firm called Campbell Luttians. With offices now stretching from Hong Kong in the east to Los Angeles in the west, Campbell Luttians is the recognised leader in assisting institutional investors in all parts of the world to invest in private companies, and especially in companies developing and owning infrastructure in a sound and engaged long-term way. In leading his firm, John has tried to put Lord Haldane's principles into practical long-term action. So now John is going to tell us something about his hero from childhood um, and to touch on the relevance of Haldane to all our lives today. Well, thank you very, very much indeed. And thank you all for coming out on a coldish night to, to hear me talk about my favourite subject. Um, it's uh, terrific to be here, to be back at King's after so many years and to where it's got such strong connections. But uh, I asked I asked my granddaughter um, that the, so just one moment, I was thinking of my brother. Um, I asked my granddaughter, um, the Otley, who is at Marlborough, um, what I sh how I should go about the lecture tonight. And she said, first of all, Bonzo, don't do it at all. People are far too busy at this stage doing all the revision and things like that. So don't go near there. But if you've got to do it, for goodness sake, keep it short. So I brought my wife with tonight, and she's promised that she's going to do a feverish science like that in the right time. So if you want to distract me from getting too much involved, send a message over there, and she'll do something to get me under control. So, but I've scripted basically what I want to say tonight, because it, it, I'm so passionate about Holiday, and that he's just such an incredible individual, that it saves me going down all kinds of little burrows and others, if I really focus on what I really want to get across to you tonight as best that I can. Um, I've got no idea what all of your individual plans are going to be when you leave K 
kings. But I'm wholly confident that wherever you're going to go, you're going to find the influence of politics out there. And if you seek to apply his principles, your life's journey will be enormously enhanced. If you're going on to university, his fingerprints are all over that sector. Um, he was the joint founder of the London School of Economics. He was the founder, was the sole founder of the central man that brought together Imperial College. He laid the whole foundation stones of the civic universities, that, which are now like the Russell Group universities in Britain. I mean, that he, um, he, he sprang free Liverpool from the, the dead hands of a combined university three universities together, so he created Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, Bristol, Southampton, Reading as individual universities. He was the rector of Edinburgh University, he was the Chancellor of uh, Bristol, he was the Chancellor of St Andrews. Um, that if you're going to go into medicine, he pioneered the whole university teaching hospital links between the, for the clinical research between the universities and the hospitals. In 1918 he recommended in a fantastic document he wrote on the structure of government in Britain post-war. They, they set up the Ministry of Health on his recommendation and he set up the Medical Research Council. In the intelligence services he set up MI5, he set up MI6. If you're going to go into the army he set up the British Expeditionary Force which brilliantly saved Europe. Uh, they, 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 they saved the Allies when the Germans were 40 miles outside the gates of Paris. He set up the territorial army. He set up the officers' training corps of the associated CCFs in schools and universities. He set up the Royal Flying Corps, which went on to become the Royal Air Force. So if you're going to go into the law, given his work as Lord Chancellor, and then as a judge in the Supreme Court of the Empire, um, the, to the Judicial Appeals Committee of the, of the Privy Council, as a legal and a constitutional reformer, his influence is also ubiquitous. So, um, think, and of course, if you're going to public service and be a politician, or better, a statesman or a stateswoman, Holding's presence and inspiration are uh, all prevailing. Um, so, thinking aloud earlier with my wife about which areas he didn't get involved with, the only one we could really think of coming down in the car was the visual of performing arts, although his exceptional sister, a fantastic woman in her own right, and an early suffragist and a, woman, a, a, a women's pioneer, she did raise the money from Carnegie to save the old Vic. He wasn't built for ballet, he was a great walker. He regularly walked from London to Brighton to clear his head. Um, but he was fit, but he was returned. And famously, on one occasion in the uh, lobby of the House of Commons, Churchill, who was um, uh, uh, younger by 27 years than, uh, than Holding, but for seven, for seven years in the cabinet with him uh, from 1908 to 1915, prodded his great corpulent belly and said, What's in there, Holding? And Holding paused for a moment and replied, I'm not altogether sure, but if it's a boy, I shall call him George after the king. If it's a girl, I shall call him Mary after the queen. But if it's pure wind, I shall call it Winston. <laughs> so there you are, that's the blue plan. Um, I've set myself a big task this evening to set the scene by introducing Holday, the great statesman, lawyer, and philosopher. And that's the blue plaque that sits on his home in Queen Anne's Gate in London. I want to make the case to you that with the honourable ex exception of Churchill in wartime, a man you've never heard of is arguably, in terms of his achievements in both peace and war, the greatest and most consistently influential statesman Britain has had in the last 150 years. I want to explain why I commend him to each of you as a role model as a mentor and as a guide, as he's been to me, as each of you in the future address the issues which impact all of our lives today. And in so doing, I hope that I can do something to restore your faith in good government through helping to bury the practice of politics as we know it today, and in its place to seek to resurrect from a premature grave the noble arts of statesmanship. And secondly, I'd like to do my utmost to encourage you, whatever profession or walk of life you may choose to follow, to embrace within that calling 
the noble cause of public service. For each of us has a role to play in public service as society, so holding passionately believe, is best built from the bottom up, not from the top down. Each of you is therefore an individual foundation stone about which society can best function and in so doing enable each of us together to achieve our highest and fullest potential. And what Holden demonstrates that with dedicated applied work, we're each much more than the custodians of our own fate that we generally re realize. Now, the, that's the portrait of Holden um, by Fitters Watt. Um, it, 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 it takes on a journey in the footsteps of the great man. Although the difficulty with Holday uh, is that one never knows quite where to start. His abilities and achievements are just so outstanding, so ubiquitous across so many areas. So perhaps what I can seek to do tonight is to whet your appetite enough to persuade you to read the book and to appreciate why I could, without hyperbole, give it the subtitle, The Man Who Shaped Modern Britain. Then perhaps you could join me through spreading the word amongst your friends and families and colleagues in disseminating knowledge of the transformation achievements and techniques which Holday embraced and their relevance to our national life, not just in his time, but in our time. For at a time of national and international disillusionment in so many aspects of our lives, the story of Holday has an inspiring quality. It's above all a story of formidable statesmanship, but it teaches the fundamental difference between the approach of the statesman and the politician. I first saw that brooding portrait of Haldane on my very first visit to Clone, his Scottish home set above Octorada in Perthshire in Scotland, about 40 miles northwest of Edinburgh, at the age of 12, one year before I came here to King's. It was painted in 1908 as Secretary of State for War, his captain swathed in that military cloak uh, through which his privy council uniform is just visible, his pale face brooding with wisdom and framed by his Napoleonic, um, his trademark Napoleonic curl of hair about that bright brow. That day, I met another 12-year-old, Dick Haldane, Lord Haldane's great nephew, who gradually over many years became my best friend. Our two families have spent some 60 years since then ever more deeply entwined. So it's been my delight to have traveled in Haldane's footsteps for literally the whole of my adult life. I find him under every stone, the foundational force on which so many of the great edifices we now take for granted were either structured or developed. So he's been my mentor, my guide, my hero, the ever consistent light illuminating the answers to each and every serious question that concerns me, and I'm sure concerns you. He provides the perspectives on our global relationships, a special insight into the English-speaking world and the Commonwealth, on our place as Europeans in Europe, and here at home on the efficacy of our constitutional arrangements within the United Kingdom. His thinking guides me on questions such as the role of an active judiciary, seen that today um, with the Supreme Court, and on the efficacy, or perhaps inefficacy is a better word, of Parliament, whether the paucity of cross-party cooperation in the House of Commons, or in ensuring that an effective upper chamber is there in the House of Lords. His understanding influences my understanding of the roles of science, research, education, training in our national life, how the military, the civil service, public bodies and authorities, such as the NHS, can best function. And his example drives my desire for a revitalized form of public service and appreciation of the richness and importance inherent in the very diversity of the groups and the individuals that comprise our society. I could go on, for his thinking informs my thinking even in the day-to-day -day professional corporate advisory work on the role of investors, financiers, a business and a reformed and more inclusive form of capitalism and the relationship of the private sector to the state, 
perhaps especially post-COVID-19 in its ever closer partnership. Holding's thinking and practice drives a principled and philosophically grounded approach to addressing all of the above questions. As Holden saw, and he saw clearly, all of these issues, if addressed holistically, can combine to inspire the spirit of the people, provide us with hope and optimism, infuse a desire to pursue idealism, and to seek for truth, and in so doing for moral as well as material progress. For Holden believed that there was no limit to human and humane progress, and it only required, in his words, and I quote, a sustained and systematic insistence on the clearest of conception of the whole and of the end to be attained. Now, as I said, uh, his fingerprints will be found all over Britain. You'll find in your lives there's hardly one degree of separation between the life of every single man, woman, and child of this country, including our gathering this evening, being no exception and the influence of Holden. But I can hear you say, you know, how can I possibly make such a claim? Surely, if he was such an influential and important um, individual as all that, you'd already know his name. You could all list his achievements. So let me just sit, set out to justify that claim. I put back up the, excuse me, the blue flag. If one day in London you go to Parliament, cross over Parliament Square, go to the Supreme Court, go behind the Supreme Court into Queen Anne's Gate, you'll find that plaque on the wall there of number 28. It's the only monument to Holiday in Britain today, the only monument to Holiday, despite what he did. As, you, as it says, statesman, lawyer, and philosopher, there's no mention of education. Yet he always considered his educational work to be the principal mission of his life, notwithstanding that his achievements in any one of those three named fields, he might have thought, would represent the achievement of a lifetime of which any one of us would have been proud. So first of all, statesman. He was a Liberal MP in 1885 at the age of 29, retaining his seat for 20 years until in December 1905, he first entered the cabinet as Secretary of State for War in Campbell Bannerman and then his close friend Asquith's government. The five decades straddling 1875 to 1925, Holden died 1928, when, when Holden was most active, it was a time of great political change. The Industrial Revolution resulted in enormous economic and population growth in Britain, led to a wide extension of the influence of the empire, but with that growth came significant changes in life in Britain, in particular in the growth of our cities and the associated social impacts. The paternalism of a relatively free market economy could no longer be relied upon to deliver social justice, and with that, the greater fairness in society in such vital fields as education, public health, employment, women's rights, and democracy itself, which is necessary in a modern state. If I say simply that in 1912, only 15% of children in Britain 15% remained in school beyond the age of 12, you'll get some sense of the state of affairs at that time. It was the election of a Liberal government in 1905 which brought Haldane into government for the first time. Two and a bit years later, Haldane's intimate friend Asquith took over from the sick and dying a predecessor Prime Minister, Campbell Bannerman. The younger Liberals, in which Asquith Haldane and Edward Gray, the Foreign Secretary, were the leaders, began to make real progress. The Asquith government, which stayed in office until nine months after the start of the war, was the great reforming government of the first half of the 20th century. Their more socially democratic policies included for the first time the introduction of national insurance, old age pensions, and unemployment benefits. This inevitably had to be funded by higher taxation, making them very unpopular with the establishment and the Conservative Party. So the Liberals had to reform the House of Lords itself, which they succeeded in doing in 1911, to ensure that the Conservative peers could no longer veto, stand in the pathway of liberal social reforms. The Liberals, especially their greatest thinker, Holden, 
believed that every part of British life had to be reassessed for its effectiveness. Not least the largest employer in Britain, as the National Health Service is today, and the British Army. The famous Haldane Army reforms, which he introduced, totally transformed the post-Boer War army, which had proved completely unfit for purpose. Holding the poisoned chalice of the seals of office of a department generally considered to be the toughest of all in government, to be the graveyard of political ambition, Haldane reformed the unreformable. He created, as I said, the British Expeditionary Force as the centerpiece of the regular army, which, come the war, mobilizing fast France on the left wing of the French army, played its crucial role in saving France and thus Britain from the Kaiser's clutches. He created the Territorial Army. He created the Imperial General Staff, which coordinated and mobilized the forces of the Empire alongside those of the United Kingdom. He brought in the Officers' Training Corps, that genius idea which enabled the immediate rapid scalability of the army at the outset of war. In aviation, as I said, he creates the Royal Flying Corps and the Security and Intelligence, the Secret Service Bureau, which is the forerunner of both MI5 and MI6. And in the second discipline referred to on the blue plaque, that of lawyer, um, he had a distinguished professional legal career. As a barrister, he was appointed a Queen's Counsel, you see, at the age of 33, he believed he was the youngest for 50 years, where he went what's called special, so solely arguing his cases before the highest appeal courts of England, and most important, before the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, the JCPC. On becoming Lord Chancellor in 1912, he in parallel became the President of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. It's the final tribunal on all legal and constitutional matters of the empire, in shorthand, the Supreme Court of the Empire. From then onwards, he was able, until his death, in his role as a judge, to deploy both his legal and philosophical skills in the constitutional structure and development of the empire. As Lord Chancellor, he made many changes, and indeed would like to have made many more, bringing his brilliant practical mind to bear on every aspect of the work of that massive department. Even his own job spec was not exempt from critical analysis. He believed the conflicts inherent in his own personal duties and responsibilities required change. So in 1913, a year after he becomes Chancellor, he advocates splitting his duties between the three several separate and distinct um, activities get an independent chairman or speaker of the House of Lords, get an independent chief justice of a Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, and get a separate minister of justice, put him in charge of a justice department that didn't exist, and make him accountable to the people in the House of Commons, thus leaving for the Lord Chancellor his central role as the principal legal advisor to the government. That's what Haldane wanted then. And as always, he was years ahead because it took the Lord Speaker of the House of Lords as an independent, it took July 2006 to be created, the Ministry of Justice in May 2007, and the Supreme Court in October 2009, each nearly a hundred years after Haldane first said we must do something about this. And lastly, before we move to consider his educational work, let's consider the third word on the blue plaque, philosopher. I don't know how many of you doing philosophy, but philosophy was the greatest influence on Haldane's life, the foundation of all of his success, and ironically, the wholly unjustified cause of his terrible and unmerited exclusion from the cabinet and from political office in May 1915, which I'll come to. The background to all of this was that at the end of his first year at Edinburgh University, at the age of merely 17, at the age of most of you here this evening, Haldane had taken a term out to go to Germany, to Göttingen University, where he studied Fichte and other philosophers under Professor Nertz. This triggered a lifetime's devotion to philosophy, and in particular to an appreciation of the work and the thinking 
of a number of German philosophers and writers, most especially Hegel and the, obviously the writer Goethe. Holding came back to Edinburgh, 17 years old, to win all the prizes in philosophy, and for good measure those prizes of all the other combined Scottish universities. And after taking up the profession of the law and developing his political interests, he maintained his interest in philosophy and gradually became a philosopher of the first rank. Indeed, shortly before joining Campbell Bannerman's government in 1905, after giving the Gifford Lectures at St Andrews <coughs> over two academic years, 600 pages when printed and subsequently published, he'd been offered the chair of moral philosophy at that university, at the time and arguably still today, St Andrews, the leading philosophy school of the United Kingdom. In 1907, while Secretary of State for War, he still found time to be president of the Aristotelian Association, the society, the leading philosophical society in the country. As always, open to wider thinking and practice, his interest in all things German, his philo philosophy, a literature, a structure of her army with its general staff, a formidable technical and business expertise, and his fluency in German meant that as the new minister for war, Holding was invited to Berlin as an honored guest of the Kaiser to attend the 1906 annual military parade. And that was the start of the development of a closeness with the Kaiser, which was to enable his political opponents to twist the truth in a way which would, in the febrile atmosphere of the war, render his patriotism suspect. The Kaiser had come to lunch with his generals in Holding's little house in Queen Anne's Gate when he attended the 1911 coronation. Holden had been sent to Berlin on a secret mission in February 1912 to meet the Kaiser and the Chancellor of Germany, Beth Holway, and Admiral Tirpitz, the head of the Navy, to seek to head off the competitive, aggressive naval arm building, arms building between the two nations. But no information had ever been publicly given as to what happened on that visit and that fueled conservative speculation. So roll forward to May 1915, eight months after the start of the war, Asquith brings the Conservative and the Labour Party into coalition with the Liberals, and infamously he sacrifices close friend Haldane on the altar of Conservative prejudice, and the most scurrilous campaign of press misinformation against a public figure which Britain had at that time ever witnessed. Haldane was accused, indeed vilified, as a German sympathizer by the Northcliffe Press, owners of the Daily Mail and the Times, with encouragement of some senior conservatives. This was the beginning of the power of the press and of the social media of its day, for good or bad in modern affairs. In the frenzy of xenophobia, which resulted in the king being forced to change his family name from Saxe Coburg, Gotha, to Windsor. The Battenberg family changed their name to Van Batten, a comment which Holden had made that the classroom of Professor Lertz in Göttingen was his spiritual home, was turned violently against him. The man who had done most to prepare Britain for war, the cleverest man by far in government, was thrown out of the cabinet at the time of the nation's greatest need. Maybe after I'll tell you the story of Hay coming to his home and presenting uh, the, uh, the, uh, a book which he'd written, the greatest Secretary of State Britain has ever had, the man to whom we owe our victory. Holding characteristically took that dismissal philosophically. He could now recommit to, 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 to the further study of philosophy and other activity. For every significant action he took through the whole of his adult life was based upon philosophical foundations and the application of fundamental principles. He was an idealist, believing that philosophy was an essential guide to the way in which we lead our lives. Philosophy taught Holden to think, to analyze, and above all, to aspire. The grandeur of idealism lies in its tendency to, the, to tie every dimension of the world into a system, to see history unfolding in a positive progression, to raise the state to a privileged position and to give human minds an almost godlike character. Before the ideals of idealism were overtaken 
by the philosophy of realism. It was accepted that the philosopher could also be the practical man in action in public life, that a philosopher statesman could exist. Many Oxford undergraduates, in particular at that time, under T.H. Green, went out into the world of social reform, domestic politics, or the empire, inspired by that same idealism, which reigned supreme in Haldane's mind, the belief that great spiritually endowed actions could have world-changing consequences. His love of philosophy provides with an excellent stepping stone for his work in education, for his belief in the empowerment of the hope human spirit was never more evidenced in that work. It started on his arrival in London in 1877 from Edinburgh to read law at the age of 21. He immediately found time to go and work at a disadvantage and to teach in the East End of London, Toynbee before. And then in 1880, at the age of only 24, in his first important political endeavour, he helped to form the 80 Club, named in celebration of Gladstone's famous electoral win of 1880 to promote socially advanced liberal thinking. This is where we find Holding's attention seriously devoted to the overall need for education as the fountain of social progress. Holding saw a more forward-looking, socially responsible liberal party as being the voice through which the developing labour could find the answers to their concerns. Don't forget, the Independent Labour Party was only set up in 1893, and the Labour Representation Committee was in fact the organisational foundation stone of the Labour Party only in 1900. If Haldane had had his way, liberalism would have embraced the aspirations of those who went on to form the Labour Party, hence the intimacy of his work with people such as the Fabians, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, his co-founders of the London School of Economics, and Bernard Shaw, which started in the 1880s and which stretched thereafter to his death in 28. Don't forget, it was only in 1880 that an Education Act finally made school attendance compulsory up to the age of 10, extended to 11 in 1893 and 12 in 1899. Haldane's principal memorials in educational work lie therefore first in his university work, second in the creation of new scientific and specialist colleges and faculties, and third in the institutions which he established or encouraged involved the remediation of the lack of earlier education through the promotion of workers' education, adult education, and technical education, including most not least the critically important cause of apprenticeships and continuous education, which is so much being talked about today. Wherever possible, this work was done in cooperation with businessmen in a region or in a specialist field who required more highly educated employees. Let me just take you through a, a fast tour through this educational work. So, uh, uh, fasten your seatbelts, there's a lot to cover, so I need to go quickly. First, we should recall the state of the university system in Britain at that time. In Scotland, there were four universities, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Glasgow, St Andrews, each established in the 15th, 16th centuries. In Ireland, there were two universities, the 16th century Trinity College and the Queen's University of Ireland, with constituent colleges in Belfast, Cork, and Gal Galway. And that was set up only in 1850. And then the University of Wales, the sole university of the Principality, founded in 1893. In England, there were only five. Um, it, in Scotland, they, they, uh, they, they, they think there are only five years. The two ancient foundations of Oxford and Cambridge, and many years later, Durham in 1832, the University of London in 1836, and finally the Victoria University, of which we're sure you'll hear more, set up in 1880 with three constituent colleges in Liverpool, Manchester, and Leeds. In the 1890s, holding between the ages of only 34 and 44, first engages with the whole issue of the role and development of London University. And starting in 1881, he cuts his teeth in the field of practical university organisation by spending eight years on the Council of University College. It was the beginning of a whole string of contributions he made at London University until his death. 
1894, hand in hand with Sidney and Beatrice Webb, he supports them in the pioneering formation of the London School of Economics and Political Science, giving them legal advice, bringing his network of philanthropic friends, in particular Lord Rothschild, to provide its early funding. LSC is, of course, the preeminent specialist centre of economics and social and political science in the UK. The Webbs viewed Holday as their co-founder and arranged for his portrait to hang alongside theirs in the founder's room. Holden then works throughout the second half of the 1890s in cross-party cooperation with the Conservatives, cross-party, in office from 1895 to 1905, and especially with his philosopher friend, A.J. Balfour, who would become the Conservative Prime Minister in 1902, to transform London University from a merely examining body for its constituents and external colleges into a fully integrated teaching university. This was finally achieved in the hard fought over London University Act of 1898, which Holden worked on tirelessly. Even then, in order to enlist the crucial voting support of the opposition Conservatives and of the Irish MPs, Holden was invited to Ireland by the Irish MPs and charged with the development of blueprint for their university system. And the plans he brought together, they were finally enacted by the Liberal government in 1908, and that created the Catholic-centric National University of Ireland with colleges in Cork, Dublin, and Galway, and the separate Protestant-centric Queen's University of Belfast. By 1902, a red-letter year for Holday in the cause of university expansion, where he brings the full force of his personality, his legal understanding to bear in the corridors of power at the Privy Council, dominated by conservative aristocrats and politicians who recognize under Salisbury's and Balfour's influence both the support Holday had given Balfour and the power of Holday's arguments. And he succeeded in bringing about a crucial change in regulation which allowed the concept of the civic university to be rolled out. Civic University, the Red Brick University, would be located in individual important cities, each supported by the local authority, by local business, by the local community, something philosophically Holden believed in, and the importance <coughs> of which um, Holden had been brought up to recognize in Scotland and had observed in action on the continent. He worked successfully in hearings before the Committee of the Privy Council to spring the college at Liverpool free from the grip of the tripartite Victoria University, which resulted in the parallel creation in 1903 and 1904 of the three independent universities of Liverpool, Manchester and Leeds. They are quickly followed by Sheffield, 1905, Belfast, 1908, Bristol, 1909, Holden becomes the Chancellor, and by the University Colleges of Reading, Nottingham, and Southampton, where Holden laid the foundation stones of each of them, and which would go on to become the next three full universities within 25 years of his death. Talking of Scotland and the continent, Holden was by the early 1900s a trustee of the Carnegie Trust for the Universities of Scotland, which courtesy of his friend Andrew <coughs> Carnegie in 1900, the Scot became the richest man in the world, financed free university education for eligible Scottish children, regardless of their means. By 1910, he was financing half of all undergraduates in Scotland. Perhaps this was a constituent reason for Holden's enormous popularity for students at Edinburgh University, where they elected him Lord Rector in 1906-1908. That Carnegie Trust still gives two and a half million a year to Scottish students. But on his continental travels, Holden had visited the great German technical Hochschule um, the, uh, at Charlottenburg, the technical high school, <coughs> which fertilized in his mind the absence of any great technical university in Britain. It took five years, assiduous preparatory work, lobbying, cajoling, enlisting the support of everybody from the London County Council to fellow politicians on both sides of the house, to academics, to financiers, to the king himself, to bring together three existing constituent colleges and endowed by a munificent 100,000 pounds, that's 10 million in today's money, raised from the Rand Lords, Werner and Veit, to finally, in 1907, create Imperial College of Science and Technology. 
He was ever passionate about science and technology and research, whether pure or applied. He chaired a treasury committee to review the system of distribution of state grants to England's university colleges in 1904. That was to evolve into the foundation of the University Grants Committee, of which he became the first chairman in 1919, the premier advisory body to the government on state funding of British universities until 1989, and which still lives on in the higher education funding councils of today. And if that wasn't enough, after leaving the cabinet in 1915, and whilst retaining his judicial role and pursuing his philosophical writing, he wrote two more books on philosophy after that. He took on the chairmanship of the Royal Commission into the University Education of Wales, which reported in 1918, and whose far-reaching proposals made him, as he said, temporarily even more important, made him more popular than Lord George in the Principality. In parallel to this, he chaired the Ministry of Reconstructions Committee, which produced in 1918 a fabulous report. If any of you want the structure of uh, the ideal structure of, of politics, of the cabinet, of the civil service in relation to the cabinet, go to that report written in 1918. It was a revolutionary inquiry into a possible whole post war structure of government to ensure more efficient ministries and cabinet government. Um, and among many recommendations, they established the Department of Research and Information, established the Ministry of Health, put in place the Medical Research Council. And for good measure, in 1918, in his role as chairman of the trustees of the uh, Sir Ernest Castle Trust, he allocated the modern equivalent of £15 million pounds, out of a total of £50 million. Pounds. He was given by uh, Sir Ernest Castle um, to distribute by him to the creation of the Department of Commerce at LSE, which was the first major business school development in the UK, and he put £10 million into women's education. And last in the field of education, on his deathbed, to complement his Chancellorship of Bristol, <coughs> his presidency of Birkbeck, the Working Men's College in London, it gave him delight to appoint a Chancellor of St Andrews, the university where he delivered the given lectures. So, our educational tour comes to an end. I think you may now understand why I believe that his university work in itself shaped modern Britain. And before passing on, let me remind you that all of Haldane's work and his achievements in education were carried out in what may be called his spare time. That same spare time from his political life as an MP, or as a minister, or from his legal life at the bar, and then as a judge, in which he also found time to write a whole range of books on philosophy, to write a book on relativity, to invite Einstein, which will be a picture, just to prove it, um, Einstein, to come and visit him in London, stay in his home, Queen Anne's Gate, in 1921. A very brave move for Holden, as a man who had already been attacked for his pro-German sympathies, to bring a German into, into, into London, um, and then to promote the enhancing power of literature through setting up the Academic Committee of the Royal Society of Literature to chair for 22 years, we were talking to one of your colleagues, the Royal Economic Society, through the whole of his time there, Keynes was his sec the secretary of the society or the editor of the Economic Journal, and he was also a fellow of the Royal Society and the British Academy, the two national brands of natural science and social sciences. So, how could one man achieve all of that. Um, and so much more. And so much more, because there is a lot beyond that. That's the question which I seek to address in the book, and I want to move on to address tonight, which makes holding so relevant to all of us. In the afterword to my book, I try to summarize Holding's key five principles. First, a dedication to establishing what may be called first principles. Thinking costs nothing, was a motto he suggested to his generals, should be emblazoned in gold on the walls of the war office. He asked himself, what was the army for? Answer, to win wars. Everything flowed from that insight. Um, it meant that he would then think about things as a whole, fit each component element 
of his work into an organism that could live and breathe, develop and grow over the long term. And this was reinforced by a passionate belief in the importance of independent research. The second principle is that a fundamental foundation, it is that fundamental foundational belief in the importance of investment in education. And the belief that education lies at the root of societal, social, and economic development. The third principle is his fundamental belief that the individual, you and me, in society, must feel a part of the decision-making process at every level. He believed philosophically that decisions should always be taken at the lowest level in society, commensurate with efficiency. Power should be devolved upwards, only if it's clear that at that higher level, progress can be better and more efficiently made than at the lower level. Otherwise, keep decisions as lo local as possible. And the key to this process is that each individual should be prepared happily to devolve powers upwards only in the search for that greater efficiency or good, but in so doing, remain an integral part of each of those higher levels. So I, John Campbell, and my family should enjoy as much uninterrupted control as possible over our family life. But we should also feel part of our village or town if we feel that at that level of entity we can achieve something together we can't achieve in our own family. And so onwards and upwards. That applies geographically in respect to my county of Gloucestershire, to England as a country, to the United Kingdom as a union, to the G7, the G20, the United Nations in their wider international groupings. But similarly, it applies to specialist organizations such as NATO or the IMF or the World Bank. But I only willingly pass up with those powers and responsibilities in order to enable the development of more effective institutions in the service of humanity. In this way, I am Fairford, my, the town I live in. I am Gloucestershire. I am England. I am the United Kingdom. I am NATO, the UN, UNHCR. Or whatever. I'm a fully paid up, enthusiastic, integral part of all of those organizations because I and others believe that in them we can do something better together than we can do at any other level of grouping. Fourthly, to achieve anything, Holday believed that one must balance idealism with realism, that there's a time for all things. Not everything can be achieved overnight. The underlying general will as Holden and other philosophers called it, the spirit of the nation has to be sought out and to be reflected in societal progress. The general will is not to be mixed up with popular will, which reflects short-term thinking and the febrile voting which passes under the alternative moniker of public opinion. Holden believed that it's the duty of the great leader to understand and to interpret the underlying direction of movement of the general will of society and to work to influence that direction as well as to simply reflect it. That's the true foundation of sustainable long-term um, long change. And finally, the fifth principle, is, of course, is that recourse to statesmanship, not politics. Holden's approach to cross-party cooperation demonstrates that the true difference between the statesman and the politician the statesman holds ever certain, well thought through views and opinions which transcend day to day party political life. Holden believed that wherever possible that a bipartisan approach was the true route to real long term progress. The statesman or stateswoman takes action today, however unpopular, which heads off the preventable evils of tomorrow. Now we all read handbooks of successful business or public practice. So in conclusion, what are the personal qualities which enabled Holday to do so much? What does it take to be a Holday? I posit the following, and many of you here will have or can develop these qualities. A first class mind, extraordinary hard work, true generosity of spirit, principled logical thinking, a real respect research, love of the sciences, both natural and social, idealism, that belief that the world can be made better than before, love of one's fellow human beings, a willingness 
to take on established wisdom and to seek to overcome the prejudice of those resistant to change. Exceptional sympathy and empathy with all classes. In Hollins' case, from the king and the Kaiser to the coal miners in his Scottish constituency. Real patience in seeking to understand other people's views, especially those that are skeptical, to listen and to consult. Deep and deciduous connectivity, but only in the pursuit of great causes. Haldane made himself the most connected man in Britain, embracing royalty, politicians of all parties, civil servants, financiers, philanthropists, educationists, academics, the military, the law, the church, great friend, the 22 years of when Randall Davidson was Archbishop of Henry Canterbury and a great friend of Cosmo Lang who took over from, from uh, Davidson in 1928. And allied to all of this, the conviction and determination to bring about implementable change and to overcome prejudice and the opposition of those who could live comfortably within the established status quo. Paul Dane was exceptional, but nevertheless what he did and what he stood for remains within the grasp of exceptional others. Each of us can do so much if we set out with clear and determined focus at any level of society. Adopting Haldane's principles, we can make the NHS, as Haldane did the army, fit for purpose. We can reform the House of Lords to make it a Senate for our United Kingdom and bind our nations ever more closely together. We could put key members of the cabinet into the House of Lords, where in areas such as health or education, they can rise above the distractions of the bear pit in the House of Commons and do some great long-term thinking and planning. We can work out what should be devolved to the regions and what should not be devolved. Holday isn't dead. He lives on in the institutions he created and developed, and in the application of his thinking and methodologies to so many other problems, we and all others face today. I commend him to you as a deeply rewarding study. Thank you very much. Scholars at Oxford, Gates at Cambridge, and Holiday scholars at the LSE, and then try to and 
change the dean's name to the ordained dean of public policy. So the head of the Supreme Court has been talking. Gordon Brown feels that we can get Holday to help us to work out how we save the union. That we can really work out what really should be done at the Scottish level and what is the, the creator means of Scotland having a greater say in a Senate rather like the Canadian and the German upper houses where it, it isn't just done by popular number of people in the population but it's a greater representation for regions or for walks of life and why shouldn't all kind of different walks of life be represented in the House of Lords or the Senate, you know, the police forces, the army, the, the, in, in, in all kinds of different walks of life. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, yeah. Um, I think we do have time for one or two questions. I know it's very cold no. in here and I'm, I'm conscious that our guests are probably going to be freezing as well. And you've got to get back to your... <laughs> But does um, anyone have a question they would like to put? Uh, Georgia? Um, in your book and um, in your talk, you talk a lot about, um, you have a lot of admiration for Golden um, and then you bring um, reverse principles in your book. How do you adopt these principles? Well, I think in a practical sense, in my life, I think what you guys and girls are going to be going on to do in, your, in the future. I read, um, I, read I, I did science here very badly at King's. And if I did do history in my spare time as an O-level, what's called those days under the tutelage of, of Edgar Sam, so I have been interested in history, but I've never read history. But I did economics at King's, then when I went to Rothschild's as a merchant banker, that um, I found that, that, that I've been gradually more interested in the whole day at that time, it's still in my 20s, but as the years went by, I began to see that really thinking ahead is the key to everything. It's all about the long term. It's a heading off, as I said, you know, if I take action today, head off the preventable evils of tomorrow. So I'll give you an example in my own firm. Um, in 19, in 2000, uh, after years out, in 2005, I felt that we were doing a lot of work in private equity, but I'd like to do work in private infrastructure. And so I said, I put the word out to various friends, I'd like to do this. My colleagues were very skeptical about it. I said, okay, Campbell, you can go off and do that if you want to do it, but you mustn't take the time of anybody else in the organization. So I got one of our guys who directs to help us. We found three people that were in there, uh, the two of them in their thirties, one in the forties, who was uh, well, two French and one English, who wanted to do something. They were engineers by discipline, they wanted to do something different in the way infrastructure was invested in. I said, right, let's see if we can raise you a first fund, but make it a long-term fund, a 25-year ever done a fund longer than 10 years <coughs> with a couple of years of extension. So you could develop great new infrastructure and keep that infrastructure for the long term and manage it. So if you're going to build a road or build an airport or um, do the Guardian Terminal or high speed rail in France or, or build schools and universities and hospitals, they now do all of those things, then build them well because you're going to be managing them for at least 25 years, if not for the whole lifetime of <coughs> So we said that it was a real struggle to persuade institutions to do a 25 year farm back in, in 2005. Today, those three people are 300 people in the central partnership. They have $100 billion of assets in 1,000 projects. They're the number one in North America for um, institutional investment and infrastructure. They're the number one in Europe and they're the number one in Africa now. $100 billion. Is that, that's, doing the right thing. That's what we've got to always do. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Um, does anybody talked a little bit more about just what he was as a human being. We had not had a chance to do it. He was a bachelor. He never married. He had an absolutely wonderful mother. She died aged 103 years before he died. He had a fantastic sister who never married. So they were a partnership with his sister for the whole of his life. She died in 1937. He died in 1928. She was a complete pioneer in her time. She was a philosopher in her own right. 
So I think that it, I'd have loved to have just understood more about his personal life. He loved his cigars. He loved his wine. He, he was earning 25,000 a year as the, um, at the bar when he went, gave that up to go into government. It was two and a half million pounds a year. He could afford to live fairly well, but he was very generous, spirited in everything he did. He never, ever failed to work. And for, it was 18 hours a day from the age of 16, your age. Uh, 18 hours a day until 72, and the, uh, because every dinner party was trying to make something happen, every weekend was making something happen. So I think I wanted to just been at the table and just seen him, uh, the way, just feeling how he did it, what the personality was like. Very bad answer, bad answer. <laughs> shall, shall I answer the question? Maybe one more, if there's anyone. Yes, please. I think that's that's well, it constantly and I'm passing. The only answer that I can come to after years and years of thinking about it is that here he was, um, and, and the prophet is never with honour in your own house. He had got so much right, and that literally the uh, the British expeditionary force saved Britain at the end of the war. The great victory march takes place. Haig leads the troops from Hyde Park you know, through North London over the bridge to the south, comes up. The salute is taken by the king at Buckingham Palace. There's a great luncheon given, whole day not invited to it. Great luncheon given with all the troops. Haig says to his ADC, he got a very heavy cold that day, that I will not go home before I go to pay my respects to the man to whom we owe our victory, and goes around to see all day. I think what had happened was that millions were dead. You know, there was a whole future to get on with. You know, 1919, 1920, economic collapse coming up in Germany. There were just bigger things than trying to rehabilitate the reputation of a guy that had been so badly introduced. People just didn't want to go there. And Holden didn't make any effort to make them go there. He just quietly got on with all the things that interested him and getting Einstein in. So, anyway, there wasn't a movement to try to rehabilitate him. But when he died in 1928, the Times and others then, that's when it really began to happen. They said, look, actually, a great, great injustice had been done. And the Times said it was probably the greatest intellect that had been put, that had ever been put at the service of the British state. Now, ever is quite a long time now. But I say to you all tonight, it, it needs a good intellect. It doesn't have to be brilliant. It's got to be principled to be able to make changes in life. If you've got that there, and you're prepared to work hard at it, and do some, and be holistic, and what you do in your gap years, if I can be immodestly, I think I presume to, to, to say so, there's so much that you could do that could be preparation for the remainder of your life. And, and we think that all day, in those four months, five months, goes to Göttingen, learns German, picks up the whole cause of philosophy, and his life has changed. So that you could just find something during that time, which taking what you've done already, all the things you'll do in the future, might just be in this holistic way, feeding on the other. And the legal mind is a brilliantly well-trained mind. If I can get that, really, that's a great discipline. But mathematics is a great discipline. Well, they loved his science. So you know, how do you bring together the different things <coughs> to do that to make them even better by taking the time to blend these things together? Well, a, a principled intellect, everyone. I think that sounds like a, a, good, a good note to end on. Um, and we'll, we'll send you off um, into the night um, to, uh, to become burgeoning Haldanes devoted to a, a life of public service, I very much hope. Um, we have a... A uh, small thank you, Georgia. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you on behalf of Kings um, for your great talk, inspiring all of you to have this whole intellect and hard work, which the book and the talk um, will inspire. And there's a lot of historians among us who are going to want to look for a bit of all their finished book. Well, I'd love to send it. If you want a copy of the book, send the message, I'll send it to you. Thank you very thank much you. indeed. It's so kind.